Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, where I make fast, technical videos. Here's something I think about often. The 70s must have been a wild time to be alive, right? At the start of the decade, electronic calculators were not seen outside of laboratories, but by 1974 they were in every home. Video games like Pong introduced computer power to the general public, and by the late 70s it was looking like the microcomputer revolution would mean every house would have a computer, just like they suddenly had calculators. Against this backdrop, the C programming language was written, first for the PDP-11, then ported to basically every computer that has ever been built. I often daydream about the lives of people who picked up C just at this perfect time, right at the start. After they learned this relatively small language, they could then have spent decades writing just C, one language, one-ish language, for all programs on all devices. C is doggedly refusing to leave Redmonk's top 10 languages by GitHub projects and Stack Overflow tags. Everything was, and to a large extent still is, written in C. Games, spreadsheets, device drivers, operating systems, firmware, and even web and phone apps. But there's only one language that can do all of this today, and it ain't C. My video scripts are dedicated to the public domain. Everything you see here, script links and images, are part of a Markdown document available freely on GitHub and at my website. Here's Grace Pointer, a hypothetical rock star developer who learned C in the late 70s. Let's imagine what her career could have looked like right up until today. Mini computer application development in the late 70s, desktop application development in the early 80s, by the late 80s she started using this new thing called C++, then Windows and Mac desktop software in the early 90s, and CGI web applications in the early web of the late 90s. The CGI spec was written assuming C, even in 1.1, last revised in 2004. OkCupid.com is still written in C. C is vital to all web apps, even to this day. If you look inside every Python, Ruby, and JavaScript app, the power behind the throne is the huge modules written in C. Grace then tracked the explosion of game development in the 2000s, and even got on the Objective-C train with iPhone app development. During the AI explosion, she was writing GPU AI code using NVIDIA's CUDA platform, you guessed it, written in C. Her skills are still relevant, now she's retired. She can still do everything today. How wild is that? Compare this to every other field. Not just teaching her skills, but the code she writes is relevant still, and will be, very likely, for her whole life. She remains a core contributor to a dozen open source projects that run on millions of machines around the world. A whole career in a single language. Grace's career sounds much more relaxing, doesn't it? Null pointers notwithstanding, of course. This is my pitch for your future if you learn Rust today. Let's take a step back. Why did C come to dominate our industry? In short, low-level portability. Write once, compile everywhere. Before C, it was understood that if you wanted portability, you had to sacrifice low-level power and speed, and vice versa. If you wanted to write operating systems and games that needed to run fast, you had to write low-level assembly for your specific architecture, and then rewrite it almost entirely for each new machine. Do you see where I'm going with this? This reminds me of where we are today, where as generalist software developers we write JavaScript for browser development, backend code in Python, Ruby, or Node.js, and bare metal code still requires C, or perhaps Zig if you're lucky. And if you want to do iOS or Windows application development, Apple or Microsoft have some very reasonably priced toolkits to show you. There is only one language today that allows you to follow Grace Pointer's example, and it's no longer C, and it's not JavaScript. As web developers have moved to high-level languages, leaving C behind, Rust is the only language that can do it all. Yes, some of these applications are possible in other languages as well as C, but no one would argue that that would be fun. C takes backwards compatibility extremely seriously, with a pace of development that only a mother could love. High-level languages tend to have more of a fuck-it-ship-it attitude. When new features are added, you are expected to keep up with the pace of development if you want them. React developers know what I'm talking about. Rust has learned from C and C++, eschewing a middle road compromise, instead taking a quantum superposition of both simultaneously. It is both uncompromisingly backward and uncompromisingly forward compatible. This is guaranteed by the Rust edition system, ensuring that libraries expecting different versions of Rust can still be compiled together in a single project. Compatibility is also augmented at a less formal level with the macro system. Like in Lisps, Rust macros make the whole language available at compile time to rewrite the syntax before passing the generated code to the compiler. This is a wildly powerful trick that deserves separate discussion. See my witchcraft video for that. A concrete example of this forward compatibility was with the await macro. Introduced to Rust for testing while the community was figuring out if they wanted an await keyword, like JavaScript, or to dot await on a future. 
The latter won out, but no core language changes were needed to test it in real code. Macros allowed the new syntax to be a library. Here is a speed run of all the things you can build if you learn Rust, a single language, in 2025. Until you, my lovely audience, decided I should be a YouTuber, I was a web developer. It's my favourite way to publish programs that users interact with. The browser is an operating system unto itself. Chromebooks certainly think so, and you can use it to make far more than pretty web pages. Because you have access to the full suite of browser APIs, you can make music with web audio, write GPU accelerated games with WebGL, store data securely on the user's machine in local storage, and even communicate with low-level connected hardware, like keyboards and mesh radio transceivers, using web serial. All this ecosystem is only available to JavaScript and languages that compile to WebAssembly, the most popular of which is, of course, Rust. JavaScript developers are half right in thinking that they have a job and a language for life, except to do what Leptos is doing here, embed HTML, RSS-like syntax, you need external build tools. So enjoy relearning that ecosystem for each new framework. In Leptos, as in every Rust project, build tools are a macro away. The one used here on line four is called view. You can tell a macro is being called because the compiler requires them to be named with a bang at the end of the name. It's just me running this channel, and I'm so grateful to everyone for supporting me on this wild adventure. On my Patreon, I offer a limited number of mentoring slots. If you'd like one-to-one -one tuition on personal organization, Rust, creative production, web tech, or anything that I talk about in my videos, do sign up and let's chat. If you'd like to see and give feedback on my videos up to a week early, as well as get private Discord access and even your name in the credits, it would be very kind of you to support me here on my Patreon. But what if you want your web app to run offline on the user's device? No need to reach for Electron. Tori is a Rust-powered replacement supporting every store out there. Write your native device code in Rust and your application code in Rust, maybe even Poem and HTMX here. A simple type-checked backend plus a simple frontend. Wonderful. Not native enough? All Windows APIs are available in the Windows crate, from message boxes to audio, file systems, and networking. Tori actually uses this crate for some of its own native functionality. Even Direct3D is available. Write your next native Windows game using it. Don't want to write your game engine from scratch? Me either. Godot has native support for Rust, and if you'd like the engine to be written top to bottom in Rust, the Bevy project might be just what you need. Running massively parallel workloads on commodity GPU hardware has been made much more accessible by NVIDIA's CUDA framework, for better and worse. And while bindings exist that allow other languages such as Python to offload computation to the GPU, what you're looking at in this example is the actual code that runs on the GPU. The CUDA standard crate compiles Rust directly into native GPU code. This is something that previously was only supported using C, C++, and am I reading this right? Fortran? Okay, we have to see some of that. Cool. Wow, Fortran's alive and well in high performance computing, eh? Moving on. What the Asahi Linux team have done to get Linux working on Apple Silicon is nothing short of miraculous. An early breakthrough for the team was, after they reverse engineered the proprietary Apple Silicon GPU, they then wrote a driver for it using Rust. They did this to sidestep the manual memory management and inevitable bugs that driver code is plagued with if you write it in C. You don't just get some free language features when you choose Rust, you get superpowers, in this case, speed of development. The first version of this driver was written by Asahi Lina in five weeks, a success she attributes to her language choice. I don't regularly write entire drivers from scratch, but that does sound very fast. By the way, if you'd like to try Asahi Linux, you can dual boot any M1 or M2 machine with this single command. Uutils is an attempt at rewriting the core Unix CLI utilities in Rust. It's available for Linux, Windows, Mac, and all other platforms. Yes, it's currently seven times larger than the extremely cut down BusyBox, 13 megs on my machine, but BusyBox doesn't attempt to pass all the GNU core utils tests. Uutils as you can see, is nearly there. While an undesirable effect in physical engineering, I'm extremely excited that I can write bare metal Rust, by which I mean Rust running directly on real-time chips for robotics or low-power sensor use, or maybe even satellites. Over the course of my short Rust career so far, I have read every counterargument by people who have never compiled a line of Rust. They tell me I can't write low-level performance code, or high-level fast prototypes, or browser-based apps, or games, or whatever their pet domain is. If you hear these opinions, don't get stressed and argue with them. Tell them what I say. Just you watch me. C's low-level portability was important for a time when high-level languages only meant portability. That's not the case anymore. We expect far more of our high-level languages. Ergonomics, rapid prototyping, excellent tooling and deployment, and web-first interfaces. Rust can do them all. 
combined with the low-level efficiencies that games, robotics, and operating systems require. I am so relieved that just like Grace Pointer, I have found a language that I can write all my projects in, perhaps for the rest of my life. I can finally chill. If you'd like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos, your name in the credits, or one-to-one -one mentoring, head to my Patreon or Ko-fi. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk, please check out my weekly sci-fi audio fiction podcast, Lost Terminal. I just finished season two of the Phosphine Catalogue. If you like mysteries and art, check it out. Modem Prometheus is finally off hiatus. Go to modemprometheus.com to subscribe. Transcripts and compile check markdown source code are available on namtal.com and GitHub. Links in the description and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.